Okay, hello everybody. I'm recording it now and I hope everyone can see this and hear me. If you don't see or hear, just let me know. So the first thing for this new year, first welcome everybody to 2024. It is going to be a fantastic year and we're going to make all sorts of cool foods this year so that we use food as medicine. And the first thing is crowds, kanjis, and dressing. And what I would say is eat four of these servings once a day. No matter what you do, eat crowds, kanjis, or dressings four times a day. Tell me a little bit. I'll go around the room and you tell me what sort of crowds you eat every day. Um, and let's, let's start from whoever. Whoever wants to jump in first. What sort of ferments do you eat? Any ideas? Fermentation queen, you want to speak up, Claudia? We've all well, <laughs> it's Sushama, for me, Kale, yeah. um, I eat kimchi a lot. So there's all kinds of varieties. You have the Wonderful. Chinese cabbage, kimchi. Okay. Fantastic. So, and you eat that every day? I'm sorry? Do you eat it every day? Almost every day, yeah. Almost every day. And sour poi, which mm -hmm. is the Polynesian uh, source of uh, fermentation, sour poi. And mm -hmm. that's the kahalo. And then I also uh, use miso. I mm -hmm. miso a lot. Okay. And Japanese style of fermentation. Um, there's another one that I do. I, I I eat umeboshi. I eat a lot of pickled, uh, you know, pickled onions, and we pickle a lot of things. Umeboshi is the Japanese uh, plum. Mm -hmm. I eat that a lot with the rice. So Fantastic. yeah. Fantastic. And just make sure that it's homemade, that there's no preservatives in it, because in China, what used to be superfoods are now cancer foods because they put yeah. E110, the preservative, polysorbate, this and that, and stabilizers, and, and then they pack them in plastic. So it's it's terrible that we're taking these fantastic ferments and turning them into poison. So please mm. make your own. It's very, very simple to make them. I've got several videos on how to make kanjis and krauts and kvasas on my YouTube channel, and YouTube has not taken them down. So you can watch them. The so how do you pickle onions? Like you cut slice onion and put vinegar uh, you, in. Onions you would vinegar. You would put them in vinegar, a little tiny onion, the round curl onions, put them in vinegar, add some, you know, peppercorns and this and that, and they make wonderful pickled onions. But uh, I would say lactoferment as many things as you can. And the brassicas mm -hmm. lend themselves to lactofermentation. It's super fast and easy. Take some cabbage, Chop it up, add salt, leave it on your counter, stuff it into a jar. It's turned into sauerkraut in three days. And Sushama, also in Hawaii, we um, drink a lot of what we call chili pepper water. And that's made with uh, the vinegar a process. So that's fermented as well. But it's chili pepper water. We call awesome. it nikoi. Nikoi, fantastic. That sounds so delicious. I'm salivating. It is. It is. It actually is. All right. And for the cabbage, it should be only with salt, no water. No water. So I for the, you can, if the cabbage is old, you can add water to it to keep it from rotting. But in a fresh cabbage, there should be no need for water because the salt will cause the cabbage to release water. Just, just push it in so that there's water on top. It should always be covered with water. So a, a narrow mouth jar is a good thing. And for the beet covers, we have to put beet and water, right? Yeah. One third beet, two thirds water. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay, so gonna, and we, uh, I can see only the selected uh, text from your account. I don't see the main screen at all. Oh, you don't see it. Now, do you see it? No. Now? No, I can see that, you know, from the email, I can see 15, 16, 17. What? And, oh, yeah. Yeah. We're only seeing your email. Uh, yeah. Oh, you are screen sharing. Stop sharing. Okay, stop sharing and share screen again. And, uh, 
Now do you see it? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, just to interject real quick, uh, Jun is a product made from honey and the tea, various teas, whichever one as well. So that was one I didn't mention, but uh, we can make that Sushama too. Okay, okay. I would say that uh, your staple should be things that are not very sweet or not made from, uh, although bacteria need to, to ferment, try and eat things that are as less sugary as possible and lacto-fermented cabbage, brassicas, radishes, carrots, cauliflowers. You can make beautiful kanji. So you take one third cabbage with a little bit of carrot in it, add mustard seed, other spices to it, add water to it, leave it on your counter. The water gets sour, or add some chili peppers to it. Water gets sour and you get this delicious kanji, which will allow you to digest bullets. You will never have digestive issues. They use it typically in India after you've eaten a very heavy meal rich in fat, the kanji. Great. When I've been making bhikkhu I've been adding a little salt. Is that recommended or not necessary? Oh, that's recommended, all right. It's wonderful to have salt in your bhikkhu It's beautiful. So believe it or not, these are medicines. These are not just foods. They're medicines. You don't need to eat any allopathic or homeopathic remedies if you're eating these kinds of things. You have gut bacteria, which is making your serotonin and dopamine and... 90% of your feel happy hormones are caused by the bugs in your belly, in your large intestine, to be specific. And you're feeding them by eating krauts, kanjis, and dressings that are lacto fermented. You can use yogurt, sour cream for your dressing. You can put in uh, sauerkraut juice in your mayonnaise. And when you put it in your mayonnaise, it'll last longer, it'll have a great shelf life. I would recommend today you go home. Oh, sorry, you're already home. You're not at a <laughs> at College of Marin campus anymore. Uh, blend an egg, two tablespoons of raw butter, half a lemon, a dash of salt, um, with two uh, tablespoons of raw milk in an eight ounce mason jar. Uh, you add raw cream to it and you stir it. And it's this addictive, fatty, delicious, Vitamin rich uh, beverage will keep you safe, satiated. It's a great breakfast. When I went to work, I used to eat six ounces of this every day. And I wasn't hungry until lunchtime. And I, my mind worked really well. My brain was able to process. Why? Because the egg gives you 220 milligrams of cholesterol, which, believe it or not, you actually need especially when your ovaries stop working and you know some of your sex hormones are not producing stuff anymore. Your body needs the cholesterol. Do not be foggy headed, to be sharp, do not forget what you said two minutes ago. Egg, raw butter, lemon, salt, raw milk, cream. Try and make it. You can use an immersion blender, you can put it in a blender, you can just do it with the Whisk, you know, just a whisk. It's a wonderful drink for everybody. And what you want to do is look for nutritional density by uh, dollars per gram of nutritional density, not dollars per calorie, but dollars per nutrient density unit. And fats are number one good deal in your life, whether it's butter, cream, tallow, ghee, lard, olive oil, uh, coconut oil, expeller press. These are wonderful, wonderful uses of your money. Cook with them, make the elixir of life with them, blend them with eggs, use them in your cooking. Any questions on the uh, elixir of life? Do you, uh, with Elixir Life um, or the, any of the others, do you replenish them when they're down and then use the, the other the parts in it in some other product? Uh, you can if you want to, but I mean, it's a drink in itself. When you mix this, you have a beverage, you know, or you yeah. can add it to your salad. It can make a fabulous salad dressing too. You can add it in your soups. Yeah, go knock yourself out. 
do whatever you like with it. It's so tasty, you know, and I add chili pepper to it. You don't have to, but chili peppers gives me zest or add green chilies to it and it'll be a fatty, peppery beverage that's delicious. Mary's blend. Give it a shot. Give it a whirl. This is Mary Emmy, one of the preeminent lipid biochemists of our time, who was greatly maligned by the soy industry when she tried to say that fats were good for you. And um, she lost her career at the University of Maryland. They won't fund her. But she wrote fan a fantastic book on fats and cholesterol. And she has this recipe. And it is blend gently equal amounts of Oopsie, sorry, sorry, blend equal amounts. <laughs> blend equal amounts of um, uh, butter and a cold pressed monounsaturated fat like olive oil, palm oil. I would not use avocado oil because of the way it's processed. I would use coconut palm oil, olive oil, sesame oil, peanut oil, any oil that is expeller pressed. You can use that and you can use this to um, butter your, you know, meat to throw as a bomb in your salad dressings, add some salt to it, spices to it. It's very spreadable. If you have family or children, it's great. Um, fermented cod liver oil. If you don't like cod liver oil, please eat liver. If you don't like liver, please drink some cod liver oil in winter. It has massive amounts of vitamin A analogs and quinones, which help you be very healthy and vitamin D. You need that in winter. So a spoonful or two every day, teaspoonful or two every day is perfect. I learned so mm -hmm. I learned something about liver because I don't have a, a real liking for it. But I, and even when I grind it up, it, I didn't like the taste. But I found if I split it or divide it with some ground beef, mix it together, it's totally palatable for me, and I enjoy it. Oh, that's such a fantastic idea, guys! Ground grind your liver up with your meat grind, and it will taste moist and delicious, and nobody will know that you're giving them liver. Kids won't know the difference. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's perfect. So the ideal thing is liver. If you can't find liver, cod liver oil for winter. Everyone has master tonic. You want to? Yeah. Everyone yeah. has made their water tap master tonic and is drinking it. Please yeah. drink it. The more of this you have, the less problems you'll have in life. You just won't be sick. Okay, quarter cup of raw milk daily. The best infection, allergy, and respiratory disease prevention is raw milk. I don't get asthma or bron The second I got here, I started to get better because I started drinking my beloved raw milk. I found out something about raw milk from one of my providers or, or deliverers, and it's called Grub Market. Mm -hmm. And I wrote them and I said, can you tell me uh, where you get your milk? You know, where the cows A2A2, A2, what are the bulls? How does that work for you? And they said, that's a good question. And they checked with their supplier and they said, yes, we have a good bull and lots of daughters. And we tested and it's all A2A2 A2 milk. Fantastic. Great. If it's Jersey, like, if it is Jersey, Likely as not, it's going to be A2A2. The old breeds tend to be A2A2. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, with that said, some people are allergic to milk, especially vaccinated children, because vaccines are made on a substrate of casein, oftentimes egg albumin, oftentimes peanut oil is used as a stabilizer, and they're allergic, like malevolently allergic to these things. Don't feed them those things unless you have homeopathically treated them, gotten the allergy out of their system. There are many other foods you can feed them. Chicken soup, broth, fish, fish soups, gelatinous soups, uh, fish products, you know, they, and the smaller fish, you can grind up the bones, you can eat the bones as well for calcium, but you need that in growing bodies. You must give them bony materials or milk. I have a question about gelatin. Um, when I make my stocks, Sometimes it's so thick that I could cut it with a knife. 
And when I'm making a soup out of it, though, I've been adding water. Mm -hmm. I could I could actually warm it and it would probably become just all liquid. But I wonder if you have any thoughts on, on doing that. The best is the concentrated stuff. But if you like it lighter, you can add water to it. But the best is the collagenous broth that is that sets in your fridge, that turns to a jelly. Great, thanks. Um, any other question? This is so important. Either raw milk or you're eating a broth that's collagenous and you're eating fish instead of milk products if you cannot drink milk products. Uh, raw milk cheese. Um, I suppose that's, but you have to check and see what the source of the milk is for the cheese or the cows or whoever. Yes, yes. Uh, in the U.S., raw milk cheese is defined as anything under 160 degrees, and that is a false definition of raw. So oh. raw milk in Europe is um, under 110 degrees, raw oh. cheese. So please make sure that your cheese man is doing raw cheeses under 110 else it's not really raw. Okay. Good. Or make your own raw. This is the year to experiment, starting with Claudia and Vidya. Go buy rennet and make your own raw cheese, guys. There's nothing as beautiful, as delicious, as wonderful as raw cheese that you made at home. Just remember to add salt to it. It is as simple as raising your milk temperature to 110, you put in the rennet in it, you stir in the rennet, or 105, 110, stir it, and then you cut it. It'll turn into curds, and you put it through a mesh, and it's raw cheese. Mm -hmm. If you get the flu, and everyone seems to have gotten some version of it this December, first, don't panic. Every time you eat a fever reducer, you're gonna be much, many more times likely to land up in hospital with a pneumonia where you will get a drip and antibiotics and even death, especially if you are older. People who are over 60 need to figure out uh, homeopathy because your biggest risk factor is landing in hospital. Your biggest death risk factor is landing in hospital. If you have pneumonia and if you take your broths and your milk and your homeopathic remedies, even if you screw up and take just Arnica, nothing but Arnica, you're gonna do better than taking fever reducers, landing in hospital, uh, getting antibiotics, and then getting knock-on infections and dying. The second thing, let your fevers rip. Fevers are a way to get all the junk out of your body. They go through, your body is going through a cathartic process of hyperthermia. It's killing off all the cancer cells. So please, once every year or two, welcome those fevers. They're wonderful for you. Uh, Lance, can you hear me okay? I can, yes. What you, what you just said brought up something I listened to a podcast yesterday. And I can't remember who was talking, but they talked about fevers in children. And they said if it gets to be 104 in the kid or even toward 105, there are certain products you can use to lower the temperature without break, without uh, affecting the fever qualities. Yes, yes. Such a good point. Thanks for raising it. Uh, we have seen an epidemic of vaccinated children who are trying to get the, the, just the, the detritus out of their system have 104, 105, 106 fevers, and then they get into epileptic seizures. So you don't want them to have seizures, but you want their fever to rip. And the way to not get a seizure is to apply rags, cold rags on their, uh, you know, so so mechanical treatment to reduce fevers right. so that they don't die from the seizures, but fevers are very therapeutic. Yes, thank you. In fact, holy, holy, um, holy procedure is a, a an old uh, cancer protocol where he would literally inject cancer patients with bacteria, get them very, very sick so that they had raging fevers and that got rid of the cancer. But sometimes they died from the infections as well. So that, that therapy kind of stopped, but it's wonderful. If you can get 104, 105 fever with cancer, you are gold. 
cancer patients don't get fevers. That's the problem. Mm. So let those fevers rip in your children, especially children who are vaccinated. Mama, be objective. Take a look at your child. Don't let it get seizures. Be prepared with anti-mechanical antipyretics. Stick up in a hot tub, I mean, in a cold tub if you need to, or ice around the forehead. But the fevers are essential for healing. As is homeopathy, and as is good food. Don't give them flu shots. You don't need to be told that. Every container of multi Vial flus contains, till today, contains 25 micrograms of mercury. It will kill you. It'll give you Parkinson's. It'll give you multiple sclerosis. Kaiser Permanente is giving our elderly from the age of, I don't know, 50 to 70, some 26 shots of flu and shingles and chicken pox and all this. And that is killing our elderly with chronic disease. Avoid, avoid, avoid. All right, the flus will cap paralyze and will increase your chances of other respiratory infections and the most damages are awarded to flu shot victims. But now it's gonna be taken over by COVID except there's no compensation for the COVID victims. They're just gonna be dead or very, very sick. So stay away from um, allopathic treatments and you guys are, so I'm preaching to the choir. Flaxseed chutney recipe, you need omega-3s, but not in the form of oil, folks, because they get rancid very fast. So, so, so toast yourself some flaxseed, grind it up with uh, seaweed, little pepper, little chili, little garlic, and make yourself a chutney recipe for this year and put it on your dining table or your counter or in your fridge so that you eat tastefully. If you eat, whatever you eat, just throw it on top. Flaxseed chutney recipe for your family. Any questions on this recipe? No. What I would say is just do it. Ordinarily, if we all lived in one village, we would have gotten together and had a day of it and gotten five mixers and grinders and made everyone five of these things for the next six months. I, I do have a question that's brought up, friends, about flax seeds. I have sprinkled them on my salad without grinding them up. Is that efficacious? Is that helpful or not? No, no, they'll be in your body out the other end. They're very okay. tough. Got it. Got to grind them. Got to grind them. Same for sesame seeds? Uh, good to grind them, although they'll, they'll digest more because you're chewing them down. But right. even those, grind them. Peanuts, sesame, flax. This is a wonderful chutney. So you toast peanuts, sesame, flax, coconut shreds together for five, 10 minutes. Add chili pepper to it, salt, peppercorn, seaweed, whatever you like. Grind it up. The most delicious chutney. Mm, okay. And it's a seasoning. So you can eat, use it on everything if you don't want to season things separately. All right, your microbiome is the single most important thing you're gonna focus on this 2024 because it will heal you like nothing else. Um, and so you wanna make sure you don't put poisons like antibiotics, cleaners, cleansers, don't use Roundup in your garden, don't use ant traps for your ants. I know the ants love to come in once a year, let them be. IV feeds, drugs, medications, colonics, x-rays, MRIs, vaccines, and other pollutants. Your microbiome is sensitive, it is precious, treat it like a sacred temple. There's a huge price to pay every time you take a painkiller or Advil or a or a erythromycin or a penicillin, you're killing 90% of the good guys and only 1% of the bad guys. It's a bad deal. So, so in your notes, it says x-rays, parentheses, mouth or gut. Could you say a bit more what that means? Yeah, mouth x-ray, like your bite wing x-ray. You know, you, the uh, dentist tells you to keep coming every six months, every two years, get an x-ray. No, 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 no. 
avoid taking x-rays. The effect is cumulative radiation. That will what about cut? What about gut? What is that? Uh, gut x-rays too. Many people get uh, do the barium test and then they get gut x-ray. You know, avoid all that. Avoid x-rays. MRIs. Unless you have active cancer and you need to monitor the growth of those tumors, you want to avoid all those things for routine. Mammograms, absolutely not. Instead, go get thermograms. Thermograms will tell you where your inflammation is. Get a baseline thermogram and then every few years you can take a thermogram to see where the red zones are. And in the thermogram, you will see inflammation before the tumor actually happens because your body is trying to push it out. But with this kind of diet, guys, you're, you're gonna be so healthy, so, so healthy. I feel like I should be giving this talk to people who don't do these things. All right. <laughs> you're the wrong audience. Okay, but you want to keep your bacterial species buried in your colon, okay? And you own your body. Hospitals don't own your body. So don't let anyone put stuff into you in either a hospital setting or with food that's bad. Don't sign anything. Don't allow them to give you hospital food. If you're ever in hospital, bring get a buddy to bring you soup. In the hospital, there's uh, bacterial infections that are deadly, that are methicillin resistant, uh, Streptococcus aureus and the pneumococcus and aeruginosa, which will, uh, which is actually uh, caused by Roundup, actually. Mm -hmm. Mycobacteriums and all that are deadly. So hospitals are not places of life. They're places of death. And unless you really need to avoid hospitals, avoid signing waivers and releases that use the word biologicals, that's a euphemism for vaccines. Mm. They will give you a shot of pneumonia vaccine <clears throat> when you're in hospital. Don't let them. So what do you know about fecal transplants? Fecal transplants are wonderful if you have C. difficile and the hospital tells you there's no solution. Every antibiotic has failed. Get the poop of a healthy person. You can do it at home. Buy a $20 blender. Get the poop. Add some saline solution to it and baste it up your up your anus, do it 10 days in a row. That's a fecal transplant, miraculous results. That's the only thing that will save you if you have a deadly C. difficile infection. Okay. Which is, which is given, yeah, which you get in hospitals a lot and from eating antibiotics. There's a book called Let's Talk Shit by Hazen <laughs> that I can recommend to have uh, the real scoop on it, get the real poop on it. <laughs> yes, yes. In fact, I was just talking to someone who has severe gut problems and she's taken many doses of antibiotics and her gut is in terrible shape. And she was saying, you know, my husband was giving me shit. And I said, maybe you should consider that seriously. <laughs> the husband drinks raw milk, his gut is like lined with steel. If she had some of his colonic bacteria, she would be a different person. It's a bacteria make you thin or fat. They change your mood. They, uh, they, they, uh, figure, they cause you to have cancers or not have cancers, colitis, celiac. So it's just fantastic. Fecal transplants are fantastic. But you guys shouldn't get to that point because you're eating so many ferments every single day. You should be giving your fecal transplants to others who need them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've read about the fecal transplant a bit more just because I was curious. Yeah. I'm not really playing it myself, but they talked about putting the, the fecal material in a capsule mm -hmm. and you swallow that. I can't see how that would be effective, but maybe it is. Yeah, it would, it would if you did time release, but that's that's tough. That's iffy. The real deal is put it in your colon where it'll actually interact with your colon bacteria. Yeah. Um, there are two types of bacteria that inhabit your colon, the bacteroidoites and permicutes, and they have very different purposes and reasons, and they come on at different times. So it'll affect everything, your gut bi microbiota, the culture of your gut. Great. It's Thanks. very important to hang out with people who have good gut bacteria, because their hands have the same bacteria, or you know they're washing their bums and you touch them. So you're getting good bacteria from healthy people. Yeah. 
Someone was trying to say something. All right. Uh, earthing, touching the ground. Is everyone doing that? Just say yes if you are, no if you're not. No. Go for it. Go for it, guys. I beg you, I plead you, take your socks off or wear your socks by all means and go on the ground outside your house and hang out on the ground for 10, 15 minutes every day. Just do it. What will, what will it do? Sunshine was referring to charged water. It'll instantaneously charge the water in your body. It will put electric, you're picking up a frequency from the earth of 8.3 hertz or 8 point something hertz, 7.8. And you are going to be instantly, literally recharged from grounding. Let some part of your skin touch the earth, trees, concrete, not tarmac, not, not road, not rubber. That's an insulating agent. Enjoy your sunshine. And the other, an, an, another thing is people saying the more oxygen I breathe, the better. No, you actually need carbon dioxide. Can anyone tell me why? Botego breathing is so important. Why you should breathe into a paper bag. Why you should hold your breath. Because it increases the carbon dioxide utilized by the body. Yep, yep, yep. It increases the level of carbon dioxide in your bloodstream. And when you get to seven to 8%, mark this, if you get to seven to 8%, that is when your red blood cells release oxygen into your tissue. They don't release oxygen unless your carbon dioxide levels are high enough. So take a deep breath, push that breath out and hold your nose. Let's try this exercise just once. Take a deep breath, push it out, hold your nose and I'm gonna count. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. Your goal is thirty, guys. Heard a few pops. 30 is your goal and shoot for two minutes on the out breath, holding your breath. What I don't understand because we haven't read or know anything more about it, but how does the carbon dioxide increase by holding your breath? When you hold your breath, you're not taking in oxygen. Your oxygen is being used up. The body only has carbon dioxide. And as your oxygen depletes, the carbon dioxide is released from your body and whatever you got is there. And as this carbon dioxide increases, your body will actually release more oxygen. So that's why you're holding your breath, right? You're holding your breath to increase your carbon dioxide and decrease your oxygen so that when your carbon dioxide is at seven, eight percent, the oxygen present in your bloodstream actually gets to your tissue. Mm -hmm. And you can do this as you're grounding, as you're earthing on your concrete patio or on your lawn outside your house. And it'll have tremendously beneficial effects. Train I, your thought, yeah. I thought that standing on concrete or non-earth material doesn't really work for grounding. Is that correct? Concrete will work some, but earth will, dirt and grass will work best. Tarmac will not work. Rubber will not work at all. So a non-insulating agent. Okay. So not, not even wood. Wood is insulating. Uh -huh. And these are the things we need to learn to do as part of our daily life, guys. So they should be natural to you. And if they're natural to you, they'll be natural to your grandchildren, your children, because you are the influencers in the lives of your families. Think about that. Um, avoid cleaning uh, agents that are bad. Just use mild vinegar solution. Wash things down with hot water, cold water, uh, you know, sprays, 
it's cut the grease with other things, with lemon, vinegar, uh, the, you know, granite and marble countertops, just wipe them down with water. It's the best solvent there is. You don't need poisons in your life. You want to eat salt, eat lots of salt. Anyone that tells you your blood pressure will increase from eating too much salt is lying. You have all-cause mortality that increases from a low-salt diet, including from blood pressure issues. You need the unrefined salt, the rich unrefined salt, which has 80 other minerals, which are essential to life. Don't use salts with anti-taking agents or white salts or things that have iodine in them and all that. For iodine, you can eat seaweed. Other than taste, is there any indication of overdoing the salt intake? Not at all. Everyone knows, their body knows what they want for salt. Do it by your, uh, by your desire. I tend to have low blood pressure. I love salt. Salt keeps me going. Um, I sweat when I'm gardening. So the salt keeps me focused, uh, I guess. And I drink a lot of water when I'm hot. So uh, base it upon your needs, not what the doctors tell you. But eat good salt. It's one of the key elements, health. Uh, it's the key medicine in your life, good salt. Uh, no need to tell you about pesticide-free diets. You're making them and eating them and eating all sorts of good things in the Bay Area. Others are not so lucky. You guys are so lucky. A further question about salt. Um, sometimes if we're preparing something with salt, I'll have salt on my finger and I usually lick it off. But I'm wondering if um, I've heard you say before that adding salt to water, drinking water, is beneficial. Can you say anything more about that? Uh, you should just not drink straight water. You should add minerals to your water with this salt potassium chloride, lemon, rosemary, thyme, you know, just add stuff to your water so that it's not pure H2O. And that'll make, that'll enable you to retain the minerals. If you just drink plain water, you'll pee out the salts, the minerals with, with this plain water. Whereas if you eat water with minerals, you'll retain your minerals. And so what, ha yeah. what happens if you one, uh, for instance, I will have something that's salty and then I'll crave or want to have some water. I've just had salt, so I don't think of adding salt to my water. Add lemon juice. Okay. Add lemon juice, beet kava, sauerkraut juice, some kefir, some yogurt, anything. Got it. Thanks. All right. Variety of ferments with every meal. Could you guys quickly go through the ferments you eat with your meals? I, I'm not clear on what you're asking. Tell me what ferments you eat every day. Lance, tell me what ferments you eat every day. Of, um, uh, beet kvass, um, uh, um, kimchi, uh, sauerkraut, um, occasional yogurt. That's not every day. Um, that's what comes to mind first. Okay. Anyone uh, else want to say? Kale, yeah. Again, so for me, kale, I do the miso, I do the um, chili pepper water. That's chili pepper water is daily. I mean, that's like dessert for us. <laughs> uh, sour poi, I eat that daily. I eat a lot of kimchi, all varieties, because we have so much in Hawaii. Uh, pickles, pickled onions, all kinds of pickled things, because Hawaii we have such a um, conglomerate of ethnicity here and the Portuguese they do a lot of pickling mm. uh, so we do that you know they do vingadorsh which is the pickled fish Ooh. Uh, mm. yeah doing a pickle fish so there's quite a bit you know a variety of um, uh, from could you tell us the recipe of your water your chili water please I, I can send it to you okay but I'll just the general email. yeah the general ingredients so that people who listen can hear it Clay, send it to me too, and I'll put it up in the health club on Facebook. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a recipe. Yeah, a chili pepper. We use a, a small, uh, you can use any kind, but we use a small, we call it Hawaiian chili pepper. They're small, 
but they're hot. And uh, so let me, can I send it to you in the email, Sushama? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You send it to me in an email, but tell me what ingredients more or less go into it. What makes oh. it fermented or rich in enzymes? Yeah, we they use the we use the um the vinegar. The vinegar is one of the ingredients okay. in there. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Got it. Thank you so much. And chili pepper is, you know, you know what chili pepper is. It's yep, a yep. fermentation in itself. So absolutely. Yeah. So fermentation yeah. enzymes, guys. Okay. This will kill cancers, it'll kill abscesses, it'll it'll just salads, raw fish, yogurt, cheeses, not heated to more than 105 degrees Fahrenheit, raw meats delicious raw meats, salamis, prosciuttos, raw oils, fruits, onions, raw garlic, raw hot peppers, lemon slimes. These are- I have a question about ferments. I make some my own and some I get, you know, commercially. Um, is there a, let's see, the question is, that what makes them ferment or how long does it take for them to properly ferment? Like beak of us, I get a refill to when I had, and at first it wasn't very strong. And after maybe a week or five days or something was a lot more lot stronger so is it the, the contact with the air or what is it that causes the ferment uh, largely the temperatures ambient temperatures and what sort of bugs microbiota you have in your life in your house so and that's feng shui guys build your own feng shui with the good bacterial spores fungal spores instead of the bad guys and the more you ferment the faster your beet kavas will ferment but ambient temperatures are also important. So in Goa, it'll ferment in two days or one day. Wow. Here, it'll take me a week to ferment good kabas. Oh. And in five weeks, it gets really rich. But some people whose zones are 75 degrees, three days. Hmm. Three days here in Hawaii, for sure, most of the time. I thought I'd also mention that every vegetable has all kinds of yeast and bacteria on them. And and when you have the salt overpowers the, the ones that you don't want to have growing, as long as you keep everything submerged. And I will be um, posting a little bit of a lecture about that on our health club. Uh, Great. Group. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, yes, do, you wanna, do you wanna talk about the ferments you made, Claudia? I mentioned it earlier, but I guess it wasn't recorded. Um, I, I have all kinds. I do a, a scoby from honey and the green tea that makes uh, John, which is a form of uh, kombucha, but it's from honey instead of sugar. I have a little bit of that every day. And um, sometimes I do a second ferment with it. So the second ferment I'm using now is elderberry elixir that I make that I just kind of throw a little on so it makes it a little bit more like the commercial kombucha that has more flavoring. Some people can't handle the heavy duty sour so you you stop your ferments earlier if you're that kind of a person and when you refrigerate it slows it down. But in my refrigerator I have beet kvass, I have cauliflower that I uh, fermented that's probably been there for about six months because I made so much. Um, I have uh, some older um, sauerkraut that's been in there that I put in uh, when it was still real crunchy. And then I have another sauerkraut I kind of forgot about, so it got softer. Um, I'm, I'm currently out of kimchi, but I usually have kimchi and I buy a, a commercial miso. I want to tell everybody when you use miso, if you heat it up and throw it up and, and you throw it into your soup and, and heat it, it kills off the microbes. So you want to add it to soup that's kind of cooled down a little bit if you want to have the microbial part. What else do I have around? I don't know, all kinds. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. So guys, you heard that the queen of fermentation, Claudia has spoken and whatever floats your boat, go with the enzymes and the ferments you love. Uh, feed yourself and your family some organ meats every week, whether it's liver or heart or, or pancreas or brain. You can get them for cheap because nobody else wants to eat them. Put them into your meats, your stews, whatever. They're very, very rich in nutrition. Very rich in nutrition. Uh, in plan, yeah. So I have a question to Claudia, actually, and to Sushma and others. Is I pretend that I am so busy that I don't have time to do a lot of these things. So I want to know in practice how you or how one does all of this 
uh, with uh, other things going on in their life. And I think of Claudia, who's doing a lot of other things too, in addition to swimming in the ocean. Um, I just incorporate it into my life. I happen to really like cooking. I look at on it as I get to do an art project all the time. And I just take so much joy in it that making the time for it's just a natural for me. So mm -hmm. I think people have to develop their own relationship with it. But um, when you do fermenting, it's like you just become a habit. That's all. Like any habit, it takes time to develop it, to be comfortable with it, and have it be great. Okay. Have guidelines like a nice gram scale. It becomes very simple to feel confident in what you're doing. After a while, you don't even need all that. You just kind of know. Yeah. Let me tell you guys, making your own ferments and enzymes uh, function as antidepressants. And I'll tell you why. Frequently, we're all by ourselves in our home and we say, it's just me. I don't need to make all this stuff for myself. And then you pull out a little jar and you cut up a little cabbage and you add a little salt to it. And it's your baby. You're putting it on your counter. Then you take a half gallon mason jar and put it on your counter. And so it's, it's this nesting that you do. But that having been said, if you can't or don't want to do it at home, you can buy all these things outside. But make sure you get unpasteurized and organic. That's all I ask. Unpasteurized mm -hmm. and organic. Okay. <laughs> Thank you both. All right, organ meat, organ meats. Everybody loves to hate organ meats, but they're actually delicious. Tongue, pancreas, brain, liver, whatever you can, whatever you can. Eat it three, four times a week. That's where the nutrition is. The nutrition is not in the methionine, in the muscle meats, the nutrition is in the organ meats. Um, anyone with digestive problems, with dyspepsia, with GERD, with acid reflux, with uh, bronchial problems, with sinus problems. If you incline your bed six inches at the head, you'll have all sorts of dramatic recoveries. I keep hearing that. And then you'll be able to sleep better. The cerebrospinal flu fluid will flow better with a little bit of gravity like that. If there's microgravity, you do better. Um, but the whole bed has to be tilted up. You cannot kink your spine, remember. The whole bed needs to be tilted up. Your circulation will be better. Your lymph will flow better. As time goes by, inclining your bed six inches is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Good question about inclining the bed. I have been sleeping on an inclined bed for, I think, years. I don't know exactly how long. And I still get occasional, not more than occasional, but congestion, nasal congestion. So that would seem to me that there are other causes or other assist, other things that are going awry or that are affecting it. Absolutely, absolutely. Their nasal uh, congestion can be happening from various for various reasons. But had your bed been flat, believe me, it would have been a lot worse. It would have been a lot worse. But we got to get to the root cause of the congestion. Right. Boy. Uh, so with with inclined beds, children fare better. Everybody fares better with inclined beds. Very good. And that's how people live. They don't have pillows. They're, they slept on a raised surface. Uh, drinking good water, very critical. You don't drink chlorinated, fluoridated, chlorinated water. See if you can get to a spring and get good water. If it's well water, just filter it and drink it. Um, try cold showers. Not for everyone. Some people will have immediate sinus issues, but try and use cold showers. It's the, it's the best antidepressant there is. In summer, winter, ice your face if you cannot bear to do showers. You'll get a toned, beautiful skin. You don't need, you should not put potions and lotions on the outside, guys. All your potions and lotions need to be ingested to have a beautiful skin. Um, it's very good for aches and pains as well, the cold shower, the joints. Uh, everyone using a squatty potty, everyone using it, say yes. No, we'll say no. Yes, yes. I hope you're using a squatty potty or it's equivalent. It's wonderful because your puborectalis muscle works well. You don't have to strain at your bowels. You'll get less chance of having diverticulitis and prolapses and hemorrhoids and all that stuff if your pooping style 
is correct. That is to say, you're squatting and not sitting. What, what, I li what I like about it, I've been using it, is the difference that I felt at first was I said, oh, I'm, you know, my evacuation it works really well, but then use the squatty potty, it, it really made a difference. And what it brought back, and Sunshine will recognize this too, when we were, I guess, in an earlier stage of our lives, we would squat on the toilet. Uh huh. Yes. And that, and that worked very, very well. Um, I think the legs are something like that, or maybe different. So this squatty potty type thing is better for now. Yeah, yeah. Now you could do a nine inch, you could do a 10 inch squatty potty, so your legs are all the way up or more. Uh, but oh, I, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, you can get different sizes of squatty potties or create a table that's almost the same level as your potty, and then you'll be squatting essentially. And, yeah. and that's fantastic. If you can sit squatted, nothing like it, nothing yeah. like it. Um, and it'll help you develop your Kegels, your bladder muscles, your, you know, so you don't um, uh, involuntarily pee as you grow older. So squatty potty is just wonderful for bowel movements, for urination movements and so on. What I also like is it seems for me to loosen up my joints, the hip joints. Mm, do that. And I hadn't thought about that before, but I don't sit for a long time, but enough to feel, oh, yeah, it's really stretching these out here. Yeah, the back stretch. And that's a wonderful, wonderful point. Yeah, you get automatic exercise in your joints. Um, so I hope everyone has a squatty potty. If they don't, please get one. Please use a squatty potty. Do not sit and attempt to poop. That is treacherous for your for your rectal parts and your anus and your muscles. Uh, make broths with good ingredients, all your organic bits and pieces, your scrapings, your knuckles, your fats and cartilage. These are wonderful things. Scrap to make great broths with feet and joints in particular. It will give you great good health. Let your fevers rip. We've talked about the fevers. Don't take anything for fevers. You are complementing and turning your cell-mediated immune system into a warrior and a fighter when you have fevers. Never let a fever die. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great adage. That's a great thing. All right. Compost your organic waste. Plant a couple of indoor herbs or plant or two. Guys, even if you kill your plants, run out and get two pots of plants and put them in your kitchen window, stare at them, talk to them, herb, basil, rosemary, cactus, whatever you like, but have a plant or two indoors. Compost your stuff so you're not putting it in landfill and you are gonna teach it forward because people like us are shrinking and with COVID, there's this whole world of like haves and have-nots, people who know and people who refuse to know. It's an 80-20 mix. So yesterday at, at Doctors Without Borders, these two guys did not believe in vaccination and they're selling Doctors Without Borders who specialize in vaccinating children in African countries. You know? so, so remember this, speak up. People might bash you today. People at work might fire you tomorrow. Uh, your friends or family might take umbrage and say, I don't want to hang out with you. Be nice about it, but teach it forward. Take your chances when you can to educate your local librarians as, as Sunshine did, did and does, your nurses, your doc doctors. Don't hesitate to tell them, I don't like your system of medicine. I don't like what you're doing to me. Don't prescribe antihypertensives to me prescribe me nutrition. You're okay, it's okay if you do that. They will sort of spring back and the doctors are very smart smart and nice people. They'll say, hmm, did I miss something in my medical training? Yeah, so they'll go do it. But if you're too scared of your doctors, your, your gods, then you're not gonna teach it forward. If you're so afraid to lose your relationship with your children that you don't tell them anything, you're gonna have children who have severe problems forward. We're in a crisis that will affect several future generations. And the only way to undo it is to educate. 
And the best way to educate is to serve as an exemplar. People need to see you do it. Your family needs to see you make sauerkraut. They need to see you doing Tai Chi or walking or breathing, or strangers need to see you doing Botego so you can educate them on the fact that two million years ago, many millions of years ago, there was actually a pea soup of carbon dioxide. There was practically no oxygen in the environment, seven to 8% carbon dioxide. And that's when we learned to breathe. Humans came out of that, that soup of carbon dioxide. And that's why today we need carbon dioxide in order to release oxygen. And hence pranayama, holding your breath is very critical to good pulmonary and blood health to give your tissues the energy they need to survive and thrive. Do some oil pulling. Instead of making dentist trip, do some oil pulling when you have a few spare moments. How many of you have oil pulled? Say yes if you have, no if you don't. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Oil pull, oil pull, oil pull. Richard has a back crown that I forced him to oil pull on. He was complaining. He said, it took me 40 minutes. I said, you've done it in 15 minutes. But it helps. It helps to get stuff out, um, fish bones out of your gums, uh, disease out of gums. And it is far superior to any dental treatment. <clears throat> if you're going to take tartar out, you can put into your mouth some, uh, some apple cider vinegar. Oh, no. Put some baking soda into your uh, not baking soda, plain soda into your mouth and then take a gulp of apple cider vinegar and you'll create an explosion and that'll yeah. put the plaque and tartar out of your teeth. But your oral bacteria are very important. You should have no oral sepsis because they're good for your mouth, but not good for your body. And when you go to a dentist, what happens? Can anyone say what happens at the dentist if he does a dental cleaning? Yeah, they scrape away parts of your teeth and your gums. Yeah, they create wounds in your mouth and your oral bacteria, which are meant to be in your oral cavity only, get into the rest of your body. So people frequently feel sick. You get endocarditis, rheumatism-like symptoms, your joints hurt. Why? Because you just chomped down oral bacteria into your circulatory system. Why Sister, not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just had a thought and it's related to we were talking about Tai Chi earlier. Um, and the breathing that you just demonstrated and had us practice. One of the things that I've learned, I don't know if it has to do with carbon dioxide or not, but that I learned through some, through many of my practices is slow breathing, not forced slow breathing, but natural slow breathing. So I'm wondering if that has anything to do with the carbon dioxide oxygen ratio. Absolutely, that's called Patanjali. And at some point you will practically cease to breathe. And that's when your body is taking what it needs and making of it the best thing that it can. And I was in a doctor's office with that and he said, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> because you were not going to. <laughs> <Because> I... <laughs> right. It was very funny. Yeah. Remember when you pant, you're doing yourself a great disservice. They tell you to do that in yoga, but in Indian <laughs> yoga, that was never the case. Right. You drink to thirst and you breathe to your body's desire to breathe. You do not go to dentists. You do not do tartar pullings with pointy things. You do oil pulling. You avoid gum x-rays. And with oil pulling, your cheeks will plump out. You'll have a beautiful complexion. I guarantee you that. Do it with ghee. Do it with uh, the tallow. Do it with peanut oil, sesame oil. Your cheeks and wrinkles will just disappear. And so let me see if there's anything else left. <laughs> I think that is it. That is it. If you have any questions, say them now, or I'm going to stop recording and we will post it on Rumble. I and was, mm -hmm. um, I will just add one thing. I remember as I was learning about eating and food, I was told to drink my solids and chew my liquids. <laughs> that is very important in raw milk. You got to sip it because it's food. 
don't suddenly drink it. Many people get diarrhea from that. So that's a very good point. You got to chew at the pace that your body can handle it. That's that's the key point you made. And that is so important. So one of the other things that came to me that I work with or I'm working with myself it has to do with the mind and attitude, not affected by chemicals necessarily, but by my own, I guess, planning or other thoughts or things that are affecting it from the past. And it's learning to relax or accept or to deal with those as they come up, not in a forceful way, but just in an accepting way. That is so important. That is the probably the most important thing that I don't have on there. That is your attitude, your gratefulness to God, life, whatever, this world, uh, the people around you. Um, it'll keep you going, and it has kept you guys going. You, all of you have such wonderful lives, such wonderful lives. We all do. We're so lucky. We're very, very lucky. And so on that, yeah, anyone want to say something else? I want to thank you. That's important to me. Yes, I agree. Thank you, guys. This is 2024. Happy New Year to everybody. And may this year bring better years um, in its wings down the road. And may all of you feel wonderful throughout this year and do all the things that you've been meaning to do. Just do them. Yes. And stop recording. Thank you again. And Happy New Year. <laughs>